<laughs> okay, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this week's SEDS online webinar. We we're really happy to have uh, Maurice Tucker with us. And um, before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsorship from the IAS, which allows us to offer all of the SEDS online resources um, to all of you free of charge. So make sure and check out everything on our website um, to see what could be useful to you. There's online um, or virtual field courses. There are all of the past webinars recording um, as well as on our YouTube channel. So make sure and check it out. And today we're gonna have our lecture by Dr. Maurice Tucker. Um, and he's gonna be talking to us about um, fossil viruses and how these play a role in earth sciences. And Maurice graduated from the University of um, Durham before pursuing a PhD in sedimentology from the University of Reading. After lectureships at the University of Sierra Leone and Cardiff University, he moved to Newcastle University um, in 1975. He then returned to Durham University first as a reader and then a professor, and his research really covers a huge range of sedimentology with a large focus in limestones. He's written and edited more than eight books, obviously super impressive, um, including both sedimentary petrology and carbonate sedimentology. He's served as the IAS president in the past, as well as winning um, multiple um, medals and, and grants and everything like that. So very extensive um, background. And we're really happy to have him today. He's going to um, give us a lecture on the role of those viruses in earth sciences. And with that, um, Maurice, thank you so much for joining us and I will give you the mic. Okay, well, thank you for SEDS Online for inviting me to give this talk this afternoon. Um, I'll try and explain how I think viruses uh, have been significant in earth sciences, well, in sedimentology, especially carbonate sedimentology, of course, but um, maybe we've neglected them. Um, but first of all, I have to apologize that I am rather ill. I have caught a virus, damn things. Uh, those pesky viruses have got me. So I am actually suffering very badly, but not with COVID, with the flu. But it's not me for six, and I am just about surviving. So enough of that. Apologies if I lose my voice, start coughing, wipe, blowing my nose sneezing or whatever, but I'll try and survive for the next hour. Okay, so you've heard my title and um, uh, there it is. So let's move on. So this talk, well, I'd like to first, well, first of all, I think I have to explain to you a few words about viruses. There's a lot about viruses that we all know now, but um, I think we just need to sort of uh, set the background. Um, then we need to look about the relationship between bacteria and viruses. Uh, those viruses associated with bacteria are commonly called bacteriophages or simply phages. Because of course, viruses occur in many cells, in many animals, including us, including me right now. <coughs> and here normally, uh, not just when you're ill. So we'll uh, talk about viruses in microbial max. And importantly, since um, we're interested in viruses in the geological record, we need to think about how they, we may find them in the geological record. In other words, how they could be preserved. Could they be mineralized? And then we can think about the geological record of viruses, if they indeed have one. But we can't just keep criticizing viruses and blaming them for me not sleeping for about five days. Um, we have to remember, Viruses do a lot of good. We'll talk about that briefly. Um, and then, of course, what about viruses and sedimentary processes? So if you think about it, there are a lot of possible processes where they could be involved, especially mineral precipitation. Um, and then to check this out, we've been carrying out experiments with viruses to precipitate minerals. Uh, we also just might mention viruses could well be involved in extinction events, uh, something which has hardly ever been considered. In fact, there are many aspects of viruses which have not really been properly considered in the um, geological record. So viruses, the new frontier in geology, do they play a role? So I'm sure many of you know a lot about viruses to begin with. So um, just to be very quick, 
here are just a few basic things about the viruses. They are absolutely everywhere, completely everywhere, in greater abundance than bacteria, okay? Normally something like 10 times the number of bacteria, you've got viruses. Okay, so in terms of numbers, viruses are the most abundant biological entities on earth. And you can see that in this uh, figure on the right, in terms of abundance. Blue are the viruses, the yellowish are the uh, bacteria and the archaea. So viruses occur everywhere in sediments and like bacteria, shallow ones, deep ones, cold ones, hot ones, and in the deep subsurface as well. They're recorded down to 2.4 kilometers. And of course they could go deeper. They probably need water and of course they need some bacteria. And we do get viruses in the rain. Seems odd, but we do. And of course you do wonder if there's life on Mars, are there viruses on Mars? Now what about Venus? We heard not long ago about that atmosphere on the Venus and the phosgene. Maybe there are viruses on Venus too. Maybe they got there before we found out. So here we go. Um, but actually, if you think of the volume or the mass, then vir viruses constitute a much, much smaller uh, amount than bacteria. And you see that here on the left. Here are the prokaryotes in yellow, some huge percentage, that must be about 90%. The viruses are about six, seven percent. So in terms of volume or mass, the viruses constitute a much smaller amount than bacteria. So you can e easily see that if you think about the weight of the bacteria in our bodies. It's about 200 grams. Well, you know what 200 grams is, it's hardly any. But the weight of the viruses in our bodies is about 10 grams. So that's about 10 raisins or sultanas if you prefer. <coughs> so the number of viruses, huge, as you can see, 380 trillion, that's quite a few. Okay, so now what about the differences between viruses and bacteria? Just to be quick, um, they're tiny, of course. Viruses are extremely small, tens to hundreds of nanometers. Bacteria are from about a micron to many tens of microns, the biggest up to about 70, 750 microns. You can just see a bacterium with an ordinary microscope, a large bacterium with an ordinary microscope. Normally you don't. Normally, of course, you've got to use SEMs and TEMs. So just to explain, bacteria, prokaryotes, single-celled organisms, no nucleus, with a cell wall, normally with some cytoplasm containing the DNA and organelles, things for like photosynthesis, for example. Um, and they mostly produce simply asexually by binary fission, dividing into two daughter cells. But viruses are somewhere between living and non-living organisms. There appears to be an argument amongst microbiologists as to whether they're living or not. They are biological entities, but they're not living in the normal sense. They consist of a protein shell, that's the capsid, and in there is nucleic acid, RNA or DNA which carries the virus's genetic information. Some viruses are now to membrane, spiky, and we know that from the pictures we've seen endlessly of the coronavirus. So the other thing are the shapes, the virus shapes, very variable, as you can see from this group, bottom left corner. But typical shapes are spheroidal or rod-shaped or helical. But in actual fact, many marine viruses are symmetrical and they have an icosahedral shape. So here's a, an, these are icosahedral shapes. They're polyhedral, um, flat sides, uh, like an old fashioned football, I often say. And of course, some viruses have tails. Okay, so the thing is, viruses are entirely dependent on a host for replication. So this is why we don't really know whether they're living or not. They are referred to as obligate intracellular parasites. So they're simple, but they only produce in a host cell. And then the virus attacks the cell, injects its DNA, new viruses grow inside, and they burst out 
the bacteria is dead and new viruses are swimming around waiting to infect new cells. The important thing about viruses, just like EPS, they have a negative charge. EPS, extracellular polymeric substance, that's mucus, um, they have a negative charge from the various hydroxyl and carboxyl groups that are there. So the point is, viruses can attract cations, which is, you can imagine, when it comes to precipitating minerals, is very significant. So one place where viruses will be present in huge numbers is where you have bacteria well developed. And that, of course, is in microbial mats. So in microbial mats, we expect large numbers of bacteria, but we will expect tens to hundreds more viruses. And of course, we know that microbialites occur throughout the geological record. They provide the evidence of the early life on Earth. So that's where we should be looking for the viruses, modern and ancient microbialites. Okay, so you've all seen microbial mats. Here are a couple of examples from, from my travels. Um, Abu Dhabi, Shark Bay, etc., Bahamas. You know what they look like, get different types, etc. Don't have to deal talk about that much. And you'll know the distribution of stromatolites. Stromatolites go right to back to the beginning of time, possibly some at four billion years old. And um, uh, we have some stromatolytic structures then. The best ones start about three and a half billion years old, and the first possible um prokaryotic fossil bacteria or something like 3.4 and then quite a bit later you start to get the eukaryotes developing uh younger than about 2000 million years ago so we've got microbialites throughout the geological record you might expect um viruses to be developed like bacteria in the microbialites throughout the geological record so we've got numerous examples of Precambrian stromatolites. I don't have to show you, show you many of these. This is one that I looked at, you can see, a very long time ago. Yes, I'm very old. And um, these, these ones are up in Finnmark in uh, northern Norway, absolutely beautiful, a thousand million years old in the Porsanger Dolomite Formation. And these stromatolites are absolutely pristine when you look in thin section, absolutely perfect. Um, uh, time to do some SEM work. Okay, so what about microbial mats? Microbial mats, um, where stromatolites begin. So microbial mat mats are quite, sorry about my voice, it's that flu. Um, the microbial mats consist of various bacteria, as we're saying, many bacteria, but especially the cyanobacteria in the surface layers. But there are many other bacteria, especially when you go down within the layers. Sulfate producing bacteria, there are archaea, there are green algae. You've also got loads of fungi, plenty of diatoms there. And you've also got the mucus, mucilage, EPS, <coughs> extracellular polymeric substances. Plus you've got the viruses living off the bacteria. And you've also got vesicles. Vesicles are produced by bacteria and eukaryotes. They are tiny particles about the size of viruses. All these form the biofilm. Um, the, within the biofilm, of course, sediment can be trapped, one type of microbial mat, but also within the biofilm, we get the precipitation of minerals. So minerals precipitated there, commonly carbonates, but we can get um, uh, magnesium silicate precipitated in the microbial and you can get uh, gypsum, pyrite, etc. But um, <coughs> um, carbonate, calcite, aragonite, dolomite, of course, possibly, you can also form in the biofilm. And uh, basically, it's the photosynthesis of the cyanobacteria extracting the carbon dioxide from the water which is driving the equation to the right, leading to the precipitation of calcite. And liberating, of course, oxygen to the atmosphere. Um, I'm, I'm gonna explode in a minute, hang on. 
<coughs> and there are many other bacteria. Well, yep. There are many other bacterial processes. Bacterial sulfate reduction and denitrification, for example, which can also precipitate things. So, um, <coughs> also related, we have two front trapezoid. Um, and then, of course, we have planktonic microbes floating around in, in the sea and in lakes. They've got EPS, they've got viruses, and uh, possibly other microbial precipitates like. Peloid sewers and lime mud, which we'll come to a little later. <coughs> ah, dying here. Anyway, um, we'll survive. Um, so, uh, just to show you a beautiful, beautiful example of biofilms. This is from the Roman bath <coughs> in Bath. And we have a hot spring here. Water's 45 degrees. And we have these wonderful biofilms around the edge of the bath. This is what they look like, floating on the great bath. And we got lots of travertine precipitating there. These pre beautiful travertines precipitated on the roof of um, a Roman tile. Okay, so fossils. Well, we all know about fossils. Um, fossil ammonite, shells, plants, etc. All very straightforward. But how do you fossilize a virus? They haven't got any hard parts. They're just organic matter. And they're so small. Well, of course, the answer is you mineralize it. So we go to uh, Qatar, microbial mats in Qatar. Uh, we've been working there for about eight years now. Fiona, uh, Fiona Whitaker from Bristol, um, uh, Mirek Slovakovic, um, a group of other people, names were at the beginning. So here we are, microbial mats. We've all seen microbial mats, straightforward. But we've been looking <coughs> at these in terms of these rocks as source rocks for hydrocarbons. And we had a paper on our results of analyzing these microbial mats out in uh, 2016. Okay, now, give me a second. <coughs> When we look at the top surface of the microbial mat, then we see that um, we've got bacteria, we've got EPS, that's the mucus, and we've also got billions of nanospheres. So in this figure, you can see the bacterium, a rod-shaped bacterium there, pretty obvious. But look what's on the top. There are some small little objects stuck onto it, nanospheres. And then look around here. All this is made up of nanospheres, about the same size as these ones. Here you can see the EPS, down here, round here. So the question is, what are all these round things? Well, we're going to suggest these are the viruses. There are other possible origins. Some could be bacterial vesicles. Some people will say, ah, it's just all abiotic, just precipitated. Okay, let's just look a bit closer. So here we are, here's a close-up. Now you can see, here's our bacterium, and here you can see these tiny objects. They're all about the same size and the same size as these ones here. What you can see is that this one is clearly attached. Probably these are as well, that's one of them. So we think these are viruses, and this is a cluster of nanospheres, which were <coughs> viral-like particles. So these viruses are caught in the act of infecting that bacteria. Right, now, now if you look more closely with normal SEM view, secondary electrons, and compare it with backscatter, what you see is that um, under backscatter, the bacterium disappears. <coughs> you don't see those um, rethink viruses stuck on the end. And all the rest of the image is pretty much rather light colored. In other words, it's brighter because we suggest it has or is becoming um, mineralized. So what we've got here are mineralized, we think, uh, viruses, but 
this bacterium is still living, or was recently, <coughs> along with its um, viruses attached. Now, the important thing is that all these objects here are about the same size, and they're also not pure spheroids. If you look at this image, you'll see that these objects are actually more icosahedral, more polyhedral. Look at this one up here. So we think these are the viruses <coughs> and they have been mineralized. Okay, now if we use the TEM to look at these objects, here you can see a bacterium and you can see it surrounded by lots of small spots. These are tens of nanometers in size. Here you can see some cocoid bacteria in section um, and you can see the EPS around and you'll see how it's got a quite dark color. This is suggesting that the EPS has been mineralized and also these little dots here, these clots you might say, these may well be um, more mineralized viruses. So all these mineralized grains, which might originally have been viruses. So if we look at, use the EDS and have a look at the mineral, the, the cation distribution, here you can see our field of view um, with the uh, dark EPS around the cochlear bacterium. And you see how it's enriched. This is calcium. A um, bit of magnesium there, but not quite so much as the calcium. We've got quite a lot of sulfur. We've got a bit of aluminium and we've got some silicon. So these, uh, the EPS, these areas that are darker have picked up these metals. In other words, becoming mineralized. Here's another beautiful example. Here's a cocoid bacterium surrounded by pretty dark, dense threads of EPS, mineralized. And within the bacterium, this is a thylakoid, that's a photosynthetic apparatus. You can see all these round micro nano, nanospheres around here, which you can see they've got some sort of color to them. These are, we suggest, the mineralized viruses, or they're being mineralized. Okay, so what we're saying here is that these nanospheres, we interpret these as viruses. They are becoming mineralized and they're occurring within the bacteria, around the bacteria, and the EPS2 is also becoming mineralized. So we've fossilized the viruses. Well, if we can do that, <coughs> then we should be able to find them in the geological record. Okay, we just published a paper a few weeks ago, actually, in sedimentology, where we've described viruses and vesicles from tufa. So this tufa is, uh, well, we, the, the example we used came from Calabria, but you will have all seen tufa, I'm sure. Tufa occurs all around the world. There are many spectacular places. Here's Croatia. Whoops, let's go back one. And uh, we have it in Mount Bath and many places around the world. So we've uh, had a look at the uh, tufa and the growing surface. Here you can see the tufa. There's the filamentous cyanobacteria with the calcite here uh, being precipitated by it. You see the small calcite crystal within the, within the biofilm made of the, calcium, the cyanobacteria. Here you see with an environmental SCM, the filaments are covered in EPS, but you can see there are little patches of nanominerals here. And here on the right, where we've prepared the sample a bit, taken out some of the EPS, you can see the very clear uh, cyanobacterial <coughs> filaments, et cetera. And you can see small heterotrophic bacteria, um, new formed minerals. Uh, there are diatoms in here somewhere. There's a diatom down there. So now looking a bit more detail with the T. We can see viruses here. There's a cyanobacterial cell at the top. That's a couple of microns in diameter. We're looking here at a virus, maybe 100, 100, 150 nanometers in size. And you can see this icosahedral shape. Here's another one, very clear, viral capsid. And these are the bacterial vesicles. They have a double wall. And um, uh, they're also present in a huge number in the two facade. 
so here you can see the viral capsids, the um, icosahedral shape, but this is now mineralized. Here's another one mineralized and we're beginning to lose the shape. And here you can see some EPS, slightly dark in places, thready, with some little dark spots, could be nucleation sites, plus uh, some vesicles, which you can see are taking on a, a dense appearance because they're being mineralized. Okay, now actually, uh, mineralized viruses have been described before. Uh, there's one paper by uh, Peng and Jones back in 2030, describing them from a hot spring in China, and they've been silicified there. And you can see them very clearly inside this bacterium. These are the viruses. Notice they're all about the same size, uh, but if you look carefully, they are not exactly nanospheres. Um, these ones have been coated as well, so they're, they're slightly bigger than they were originally. Okay. So I hope I've shown we can fossilize viruses. So the next question is, what about their geological record? Well, in fact, the micro microbiologists or whichever division of biological sciences studies the origin of viruses, I'm not sure if it might be virology, but anyway, whichever branch studies it, um, there seem to be several way ideas about the origin of viruses. But uh, this chap, Kunin, <coughs> is one of the um, famous people in virus studies. He seems to think that viruses go back to before the origin of life, uh, or about the same time. Um, and it's quite easy to imagine that uh, as an explanation. The viruses were created in Darwin's little warm pond, and then they continue to evolve. First of all, you have replicating chemicals, then they start replicating a bit more complicated way that might give you the viruses and and, and then eventually or, or at the same time you get you know life and viruses live off it whatever but it doesn't really matter because we know that life started about four billion years ago so we should be thinking of looking <coughs> back in the precambrian for evidence of the viruses okay so how are we going to recognize them though well, I've already given you a lot of clues. For first of all, the size range. We should find the size range is quite limited, tens to, tens to few hundreds of nanometers. But in any one situation, you would expect to find large numbers of a similar size. Um, and then I've talked about the shape, nanospheres, being icosahedral. Just look at these, these shapes. Um, they're not perfect spheres. The problem, of course, is that they coalesce. That is one of the features of viruses. They like to coalesce, get together, as they are here. Um, then, of course, the next thing is uh, the context. If you've confined them associated with bacteria, then that's a good start to thinking they are viruses, uh, rather than if they're just scattered around without any bacteria nearby. In other words, we need to look in microbial. Um, um, and of course, microbial lights, as we know, are now a very diverse group of um, rocks. Uh, and then the minerals. Um, well, I've already shown examples of uh, viruses being mineralized by carbonate, but um, of course, uh, we've got different types of carbonate calcite, aragonite, dolomite, etc. And the problem with uh, carbonates is they can recrystallize quite easily. So it might be overgrown, it might be difficult to recognize nanospheres. Silica, on the whole, tends to be a bit more resistant to recrystallization. So, but nevertheless, look in hot spring deposits. <coughs> we may find some uh, silicified viruses there. Iron minerals, of course, is another possibility because viruses are often involved with iron bacteria and you can find many iron minerals one should look carefully at those to see if there any, there's any evidence of the viruses present. Phosphate minerals too. So we should see viruses present throughout the geological record. Um, now, of course, there are many, um, there are many, um, there, 
many SCM pictures uh, published in the literature. So one can easily go back and look at some of these to see if, if there are, are any, Im, any images which contain evidence of viruses. So here's just one example. There are, there are quite a lot, actually, many, if you go back. Here you can see EPS described by um, some Chinese authors. Um, clear EPS is contracting the um, mucus. But associated with it, you see all these um, nanospheres which are beginning to coalesce just as uh, we see with um, viruses and their precipitates. And here's a recent paper, 2021, where um, it's a church, uh, but they actually describe these tiny particles as solidified viruses. <coughs> Here's another <coughs> very old example from the Paleoproteozoic. You can see this particular rock is covered in nanospheres, and all the nanospheres are about the same size, and they are all not exactly spheroidal. You can, if you look carefully at these, you'll see some of them have got little sides. You can spot them. In other words, they're icosahedral, similar size, similar shape. They're very likely to be silicified viruses. Okay, well, um, I hope you will believe me that they can go back in their geological record right to the beginning. Something we should look out for. Um, well, uh, viruses are not all bad. Um, viruses do a lot of good. Viruses are actually essential in terms of biogeochemical cycles and biological diversity. So we have recycling of organic matter, for example, through infection and cell lysis, the uh, back viruses attacking bacterial cells. Viruses are responsible for the death of something like 80% of all prokaryotes. I think it might be every day, but I can't actually remember. So this releases nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, nutrient elements, which then stimulates further microbial growth. So nutrient supply, absolutely essential. This, at the bottom line, is these viruses that are behind nutrient supply. They return organic matter, decompose it, break it up, return it to the base of the food chain. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that marine viruses, they do uh, control populations. They do prevent bacterial population explosions. So this allows a broad diversity of species to exist. I mean, of course, you might also say, but viruses are involved in survival of the fittest. Um, some, some animals will survive better than others by a viral attack in the same way that some humans will survive better than others. <laughs> Maybe it's just an age thing. Um, then, of course, um, viruses can induce evolution in their hosts by improving the gene pool and um, um, in so doing, the signatures from the viruses, the RNA DNA, are carried forward in the new organisms. Um, and in fact, people often are doing research on human genome and finding there are bits of old viruses there. But anyway, what else in earth sciences? They, viruses are essential to our world. They do enormous amounts of good, but they always get a bad press. Okay, but what else? Well, precipitation of limestones, of course. We've got to come back to limestones. <coughs> so, Throughout the geological record, there are huge amounts of limestone. Um, and of course, a lot of it's very fine grained. Uh, we know that some limestone is formed by corals and shells and algae and this and that. But actually, a huge proportion of it is just fine grained. So, where did it come from? Well, if you read classic textbooks, you'll say, well, it's all precipitated. Yeah, but that's not quite so easy. Not so easy to precipitate calcium carbonate when you want. So um, there are many classic examples of fine-grained limestones. Perhaps the Solnhofen is one of the most famous. Um, and planktic um, cyanobacterial blooms have often been invoked. 
as the origin of this very fine grain carbonate. But actually, could it be their associated viruses? The viruses associated with the plankton um, bacteria, which provide, which then become a bit mineralized and they provide the seeds for carbonate precipitation. It's a possibility. Um, numerous, numerous Precambrian fine grain limestones as well. So let's go back to the microbial mass in um, Qatar and have a look at the minerals precipitated there. Well, if we look in these mats, they're absolutely full of minerals. Look, we've got all these bundles of calcite crystals and look where they grow from. Tiny points, you can see there. Um, <coughs> they grow from these bundles of crystals into more obvious crystals as here. We've got dolomite, here's a dolomite rom covered in EPS. We've got Paligorska. We've got lots of crystals growing in the microbial mat. But how do they grow? Do they just suddenly materialize out of the supersaturated water, poor water, seawater? In other words, homogeneous nucleation? Are they squeezed out by the supersaturation? I mean, of course, we've got the photosynthesis going on there of the bacteria, which will change the microchemical environment of the water, which will also, which will precipitate carbonate. But the simpler way to precipitate lots of carbonate is by having seeds or nuclei. In other words, heterogeneous nucleation. Through seeding, it's much easier. So we suggest that the mineralization of viruses it what is what provides the nuclei for further carbonate precipitation. But of course, it's not just in microbial mats where you've got bacteria with their billions of viruses. It's almost everywhere, and notably in the oceans, where we've got planktic bacteria, which are super abundant. So you'll have just as many, 10 times, 100 times more viruses. So we suggest viruses, mineralize them a bit, and they can be the seeds for crystal growth. And of course, we have things like the whitings that we see in Bahamas and Abu Dhabi. Um, the whitings could be another example of viruses um, uh, being involved in the precipitation of lime mud via the bacteria that are living there in those uh, warm waters or cold waters if they're upwelling. Um, okay, so uh, that's, that's uh, whitings. Uh, and then we've got ooids. Of course, in the last five years, a lot of people have turned around and suggested that ooids are actually microbial. Uh, well, it's a good idea. We have, our, I'm living in Bath, Bath to the west of London near Bristol. Bath is made of oolite, Bath stone, very famous building stone made of ooids. So um, it's been suggested, um, Greg Rebelier and Maria Diaz, that, and others that um, oh, well, back in the probably in the in the 19th century, I can't remember being old. Um, that um, ooids are precipitated through bacteria. It's, it's been quite a, um, a long running suggestion. It's quite likely, you might say. But actually, when you start to look at the SEM images, SEM images provided in uh, recent papers, then that they, the authors, spot all these nanospheres, as you can see. Look at these nanospheres um, scattered everywhere. Um, well, sure, well, of course, um, uh, there were times when we might have thought that nanospheres were like the first precipitate. Uh, so they the first precipitate in a situation where you can have precipitation. The first precipitate is a tiny nanosphere, then it grows. But what about the possibility that these are mineralized viruses? After all, if we've got bacteria here, then you're going to have 10 times, 100 times more of the viruses there as well. And we know that they can be mineralized, so they can help the precipitation of uids. And the same course can go for peloids. Look at my picture here, SEM, of the Qatari microbial map with these clusters of nanospheres. Well, you can imagine that easily becoming a peloid. 
So maybe peloids are also part of this <coughs> viral spectrum. Okay, last bit now. Um, so um, there have been numerous experiments right back to the 19th century using bacteria to precipitate calcium carbonate. And of course, bacteria will precipitate calcium carbonate. Um, and uh, I've been um, um, working with some colleagues in, in Shandong in China over the last uh, few years. They've been conducting numerous experiments, um, different bacteria under different conditions and different magnesium calcium ratios to precipitate these various minerals, calcite, batterite, et cetera, et cetera, there. Um, haven't yet precipitated dolomite. So here you can see, these are all the sorts of minerals that are precipitated in the presence of different um, bacteria. Um, and of course, once things are precipitated, they can grow and you can develop these crystals. But if you look closely at some of these images, you can see they're almost identical to what I was showing you earlier on from Qatar. All these little tiny dots in the EPS around the outside of these bacterial cells. This is carbonate. This is carbonate precipitated by viruses, I would suggest. So um, we've been carrying out experiments. Uh, we being uh, Mirek, and um, uh, he's a geochemist, Warsaw, and Andrzej, who's a microbiologist in Krakow. And so what they did was extract the viruses from E. coli. Now, E. coli is a very common bacterium, as you probably know. You probably, well, we will all have some in our stomachs. I've probably got a lot more now. Um, and um, these E. coli bacteria are, um, uh, you, you can extract the viruses. And here you can see the viruses that come from these bacteria. They are about 100, 150 nanometers in size. And you can see here, this is before we started the experiments, they started to sort of coalesce. So these are the viruses and here in the middle of the bacteria. So we conducted various experiments by adding more and more sodium carbonate to calcium chloride, but we had a billion viruses per mil. So that's a lot, but actually it's about the number of viruses you get in a mil of or, oh, yeah, yeah it's, more, it's less actually, in air of seawater. But there were no bacteria present. We were well, as well tested for that. Uh, and we, of course, also did uh, um, experiments with no phages, no uh, viruses. So this is what we found. When we used our viruses, we got all sorts of precipitates, as you can see. Uh, and the precipitates, they grew into different sizes. Here you can see an early stage we got a lot of we got a lot of precipitates here about the same size they're beginning to coalesce <coughs> we've also got lots of small particles as you can see here uh, all mineralized and you can see the shapes definitely viral shape um, the other interesting thing is that we found that the mineralogy was different between the control experiments and the um and the actual experiments with the viruses. With viruses, we got 70% batterite. With the controlled experiments, only calcium. Well, batterite, as you probably know, is an unstable form of calcium carbonate. So with the viruses, we were getting this unstable form. We, we know which in geological terms could be a bit of a problem. If viruses are precipitating lots of calcium carbonate, but it's coming down as batterite, then it won't last more than a few days as batterite. If it changed to calcite, then how do we recognize it? Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, what we are showing is that viruses, yes, do have a, have a, a role and do have a make a difference in the precipitation of carbonates in terms of the crystal size, uh, the shape, the coalescence we see, and the mineralogy. So this, this is, I think, really significant. We're showing the viruses have an effect. It makes you wonder, when you do experiments with bacteria to precipitate carbonates, and there are that, this, these experiments are going on all around the world, do those experiments remove the viruses? 
before they carry out their experiments using bacteria. Something to think about. Okay, um, iron. Well, I mean, about, what's it, 2008. Um, 13 years ago, paper was published showing iron being precipitated in a river in Spain by viruses. Um, iron being precipitated by viruses. Nobody has run with this idea. People have talked about bacteria, of course, but nobody has really explored the idea of viruses precipitating iron deposits. Okay, finally, last two points. Um, extinctions. Well, I mean, here we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it's not a mass extinction yet, but uh, <laughs> you never know. And um, um, anyway, there are mass extinctions and there are background extinctions. Now, as you probably know, there are five major extinction events through the Phanerozoic. Actually, a sixth has just been recognized. This number six here in the middle of the Triassic has recently been designated another um, mass extinction. Uh, that one is due to rain. It didn't stop raining for a few hundred years. It sounds like Britain at the moment. We've had rain and rain and rain. But anyway, um, so mass extinctions. But um, the point is, there are many background extinctions going on all the time. And these background extinctions are normally of specific organisms becoming extinct, new ones evolving, uh, often environmentally driven. And um, it could well be that viruses are involved. Viruses through bacteria are involved, which cause these background extinctions to take place. Well, nobody really, to me anyway, seems to have been uh, pursuing this idea, which seems strange when the, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You'd imagine people might think, hey, did we have these sort of issues back in the past? Okay, that takes us to the last point, what about the possibility of finding viruses on Mars? Well, of course, we won't find them until we get some samples, um, but they're looking very hard for the samples to prove the existence of life. And I'm sure you're all following the um, activities of perseverance there. It's trundling around at the moment near this delta in Jezero crater. And you may have seen the the uh, beautiful, beautiful pictures published recently showing this prograding delta uh, from this river system coming down into the um, in, in, into the crater lake. Beautiful um, forsets there. And um, that this is where they're going to spend some time collecting samples. Where would I look for the microbes and the viruses? It's not here at all. This to me is an active delta. Lots of sediment building out into the crater lake. I wouldn't look out there at all. I'd go over here to the marginal area of Jezero Crater, where they've already identified carbonate sediments. Get the Perseverance rover over here. It might be like Mono Lake in California, where the Tufa Mounds are developing. Anyway, viruses up there too, possibly. Okay, so just to conclude, viruses do become fossilized and virus-like nanospheres can be found right back to the Precambrian. No reason why we shouldn't have fossilized viruses. So the other point, if you mineralize viruses, they could be the seeds for further carbonate or other mineral precipitation. Viruses could be instrumental in forming rocks. The role of viruses in species extinction needs to be explored. And I think viruses are completely neglected in the earth sciences. They must have played many roles, but we haven't recognized them yet. Viruses are a new frontier in earth sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maurice. Absolutely fantastic, fantastic talk. Um, um, everybody, uh, 
uh, Chelsea's had to run off, so I'm taking over for the actual question section. Um, please start typing your questions now. Use our chat. Um, write your questions to everybody. Make sure they go to everyone. That way we can all see them. Um, don't forget to mention where you're watching from. It's very useful for us to know where people are watching from. And while Morris has a little bit of a breather, I'll read out our first questions because they're coming in nice and fast. Um, the first question is from Nick McCabe, uh, watching from Cambridge. Is there an isotopic signature related to the viral precipitates? Uh, simple answer, no. <laughs> there you go. No, uh, <laughs> nice to, uh, nice to uh, hear that you, nice to discover, Nick, that you, you're there listening. But no, we don't expect there will be any viral signature. But, uh, but to be honest, nobody's looked. But with um, uh, isotopes, especially the obvious ones that one would use, carbon and oxygen. There are so many, possi <coughs> so many possibilities of um, alteration. But anyway, nevertheless, that's definitely something one should um, uh, have a go at. But I uh, would be, um, well, one might be surprised, but I'd be surprised. <laughs> All right, thanks, Morris. Um, okay, next question from uh, Laura Newson. Um, these viruses can't live without bacteria, and bacterial communities in the environment always have viruses. So, will it ever be possible to separate the out the influence of viruses or bacteria on carbonate precipitation? Well, that's what I was trying to show. Yes, we separated the viruses from the bacteria. You can do that, well, microbiologists can do it. You can take the viruses and purify the virus uh, sample and then use it in your experiments. So you can carry out experiments, precipitating minerals, whatever you want, uh, with viruses. Um, that's We've done that, we've shown it does work. The other point that I made is a lot of people for a lot of decades have been carrying out experiments precipitating carbonate with bacteria. But you ask them, do they separate the viruses away from the bacteria before they carry out their experiments? I'd be staggered if anybody has ever done that. They probably never thought of it. And so well, it could well be that all those experiments have been carried out for decades, still being carried out, um, are missing the point. It could be not the bacteria they've got, but the viruses with the bacteria, because those viruses are there, as I've just said, 10 to 100 times more than the bacteria. So it's an open field, in my opinion. It should, that sort of thing should be looked at. Thank you, Morris. Okay, next we have um, Nina Wishon from uh, watching from Bremen. Uh, Nina is asking, is it known why viruses mainly induce batterite precipitation, or do you have any hypothesis on why that is the case? Uh, no, we don't yet. We've only we've um, well we've we've had one series of experiments which is published, <coughs> and um, we're not sure why that should be. Uh, I mean, but it might be it might be because batterite is easier to precipitate than uh, calcite or aragonite, and um, and of course it's the first time anybody's tried to carry out such experiments. So we 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 used um, sodium carbonate and calcium chloride, two classic chemicals, putting them together. Um, you know, maybe one has to do use use um, fluids which are closer to seawater, et cetera. Um, it's early days. Yeah. You know, we, we, nobody really has done this type of thing before. So we're not really sure what we're going to, we didn't know what we were going to get, uh, whether it would make any difference. But so, you know, suck it and see. You can be, you have to try these experiments, but, but I mean, very complicated very expensive. So you need a lab already set up for microbiological work, but um, I'm sure there must be people out there who are interested. 
Great. Well, th thank you, Morris. Um, while we wait for more questions, and people, please do type your questions. Um, I'm sure people are typing some very long questions at the moment. That's why we're not seeing any. But please do send us your questions. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, interject with one. Um, Morris, uh, you did sort of touch on this, but could you expand? Why, why do you think they have been so neglected? What, what is the reason? Is, is it just... Is it down to scale? Is it down to just nobody's had the idea, lack of evidence? I mean... Well, I, th I think part of it's nobody... And uh, nobody, um, I don't know, maybe nobody realized that they were there in, in, in the viruses were there in microbial max to the extent that they are. And when people started on microbial max, there, were, there are a couple of papers, you know, back in the, in the noughties, early 2000s, which talk about these things, but not viruses don't appear much. And it, I don't think it was on people's radar. And um, well, it, it did come, it came to our attention when we looked at our images. When we started working in Qatar, we looked at our images and then we saw these bacteria and there was a virus stuck on them. You know, you could hardly think, well, what else is it? And then when you start looking around, you think, well, why can't the viruses be the nanospheres, which people have been talking about, of course, yeah. for a long time. Uh, but people were always thinking, oh, well, it's the first abiotic inorganic precipitate. Therefore, we don't need to worry about it. But uh, so what we're doing basically is providing an alternative, alternative explanation. Yeah, but I mean, uh, it's, it's one of those things. Um, I don't think people... Well, I mean, and I did suddenly, almost during lockdown, think, well, you know, this was uh, the beginning of lockdown, thinking th there's a story here. There's, nobody is thinking about the possible role of viruses. So that's what I wrote my short paper. Excellent. Thank you. And um, next question is from John Reimer, um, watching from Amsterdam. John says, great talk, Morris. Uh, do you think that amorphous calcium carbonate particles found in hydrous organic matrices matrix are viruses? Well, it's quite likely. Have a look. <laughs> look at their, as I've said, have a look at their shape, their size, every, every, you know, why not? Small particles. Um, don't have to be, it can be abiotic. I'm very, I'm not trying to push them too much, even though they're trying to kill me at the minute. Um, but I, I would, uh, uh, they, they, they see the, the, the perishing things are everywhere. So why shouldn't they be involved in everything? Um, yeah, well, one can, one has to check. Good SEM, use the TEM if it's more, very modern and uh, see what you see. If you go back and look over the last five years at, at uh, papers that are describing microbialites and stuff, you will often see there are viruses in their samples. If you read their papers on microbial mats in the not too, in the very recent years, you'll find no mention whatsoever of viruses, even though it's a major part of um, a biofilm. Great, yes, absolutely in agreement there. Um, Mark Housen, um, watching from Bristol. Mark, um, could aragonite in shells have been originally biomineralized as batterite and then soon after converted to aragonite? Um, no, I wouldn't have said so. Not, not the, not the aragonite in shells. No, no, the aragonite in shells is. But as I understand it, it's precipitated by the mantle, the organic matter of the shell. So, although, of course, you never know whether my virus is living inside the shell, inside the, the organism or whatever, it's always possible. Um, viruses could be in, involved in um, the precipitation of calcium carbonate for some um, organisms. Well, that's possible because. Organisms do use viruses to do different jobs for themselves. Like, yeah, our stomachs are full of viruses, but they're the good ones. They do, they're going doing good things for us. And it could be that some organisms have managed to secure viruses to do things for them, like precipitate their shells. Probably not, but anyway, you know, I, I think we just have not considered them fully at yeah. all. 
Well, while we're waiting for more questions, I'm sure we'll have some more, but um, while we're waiting for more questions, um, I'll pick up on something you just mentioned. Um, obviously, as you've said many times through your talk, that viruses are ubiquitous. Um, and I mean, you, if you were a betting man, where do you predict that we'd find the next conclusive evidence of mineralizing viruses? Um, well, I, I think we'll find that iron, <laughs> iron stones, iron formations. So then in that banded iron? Vir yeah, I think we'll find that viral. But you see, that's the point. People say, oh, it's bacteria. Yeah. But I think that means it's probably viral. Um, well, so, you know, most phosphates, phosphates will have a, a huge viral input. Um, and uh, well, it, it's almost like endless. Yeah. Okay. Where, where could they be involved? Well, they are involved everywhere. All right. Well, here's a question as, as we have every week from Valentin, um, who's watching from Aachen. Um, given the insane diversity of viruses out there, um, why most of the nanospheres are also similar, I presume, in size and shape? Well, that's not actually, um, it's true to say, uh, yeah. oh, go on. It's true to say that there's a huge variety of um, virus shape, sure. But the majority of uh, marine viruses are icosahedral, the nanospheres with the icosahedral shape. And um, that's by far the most common in the marine environment. And of course, it's the marine environment which we're seeing most of the time through the geological record. Sure. Um, in the in a, in in this preserve, so um, uh, and probably in lakes too. So I, that's I think that's the reason, the main reason. But I agree that they can be very diverse in um, in their shape. Okay. Well, thank you. thank you, Maurice. If we if we don't have any more questions, I'll give it a second. But if there aren't any more questions, then I will. I, I'm sure that you need to rest your voice <laughs> after battling your way through that. And uh, again, we we really do thank you for. Support. It was a bit. It was difficult at one point. <laughs> I I was almost tempted to interject and ask if you yeah. wanted to postpone. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But we really do appreciate you battle it. You you know you took on your subject in yeah, every exactly. way. <laughs> Yeah. So thank, okay. you for, thank you very much, Morris. Um, and before Sorry. everybody leaves, um, I just want to um, announce to everybody that next week, um, please come and join us when Tracy Frank, who I saw was in the audience, will be telling us uh, some salty tales of diagenesis in Antarctica. So hopefully we'll see you all then. And again, thank you, Morris. Bye bye. Okay. All right. Bye.